What's up everybody and welcome to episode 8 of my poker vlog. My wife is out getting a brand new tattoo. So we're home with the kiddo and when she gets here we're going to head off to Prime Social and hopefully play some 5-5. Five five. It's a Friday night, that means there's a decent chance that the 5-5 five five gang could get off. If not, uh, we'll definitely be playing either 1-3 Hold'em or 1-3 PLO. It's been kind of a long week at work, so we are pretty excited to go and play some cards. Hopefully we run good and play some big hands. Taco House in the Heights before on the vlog, and now we're at the new location, which is actually closer to our house. And they have invented the most amazing breakfast taco known to man. So we talked about their chilaquiles before and their breakfast tacos. Now they have combined the two to make the ultimate breakfast food. Got to work off some of those taco calories. And we're making a quick stop at Treehouse Park in Bridgeland near Cypress, Texas. Time to break down some poker hands. Was gonna do hands on the hammock, but it started raining. So we're gonna do hands in close proximity to the hammock. So we got to Prime at about eight o'clock on Friday night, and we were happy to see that the five-five game was already going. So we jumped in and got started. Generally, if the 5-5 gets going, it's later at night, but apparently it had been running since 2 p.m., so um, that's good, and hopefully we'll see some more of that in the near future. So the first thing I noticed when I sat down is that everyone was really deep. I didn't see hardly any stacks under 1,000, and I saw a couple stacks that were at least double that or more. It looked like there was a guy two seats to my right who was sitting on about four or five thousand when I sat down. So looks like there's been some action at this table. The max buy-in is two thousand I think. Generally people buy in around five hundred to a thousand. About forty five minutes into the session we look down at two black queens. I go ahead and put in a twenty five dollar standard open from the hijack and we get a three bet from small blind. He makes it 125. This player is a regular. He probably plays at this card room about 30 hours a week. And anytime the 5 5 game is going, I pretty much see him in it. He's not a very tricky player. He generally plays pretty straightforward, 
but his three bet range from the small blind here against my late position raise doesn't necessarily have to be a super strong hand, but it's probably not gonna be a total bluff. Interestingly, the big blind calls. The big blind I've never seen before. Uh, he said he was from out of town, but I got the impression that he was a rec player and liked to splash it around a bit. So when he flats the three bet here, I'm not exactly putting him on the strongest range. What this does is it creates a opportunity for a good squeeze bet. Normally I'd probably flat a three bet with queens. Um, we're pretty deep. I think I'm about 1.3K effective with the original three better and the caller has a little bit less than that. I start thinking about whether or not I want a four bet here and the more I think about it, the more I like the idea, simply because I know that the caller's range is probably not super strong, and I know that the three better is a decent enough player that he's going to fold some hands that he might normally call if we were just heads up. Uh, knowing that there's a player to act behind him, and also knowing that he's going to be acting first against possibly two opponents on the flop. So we go ahead and make the four bet. We put in a bet to $400. It's kind of a small sizing, but um, considering the stack sizes, I think it's appropriate. Uh, typically, I like the size a little bit bigger, but in this hand in particular, one, we have position, so I can size a little bit smaller, and two, I don't wanna put so much of my stack in that I'm pretty much forced to call a five bet jam because I think that if this player five bet jams with another player left to act, uh, we are probably almost certainly crushed by either aces or kings. But we don't have to worry about it because after a pretty decent tank, the small blind folds and soon after the big blind also folds. So we take down a pot without a skirmish. So the next hand we're talking about, we have ace jack of hearts in middle position. There is an early position limper. We bet 30 and we get two callers, one from small blind and one from the limper in early position. Flop is queen eight three with two spades. Small blind donk bets $75. The early position player folds and now we have to think about if we can continue with our hand. Generally, I don't like the idea of opening a pot pre-flop and then folding uh, to a donk better, mainly because we'll probably just be folding too many hands in this situation. So I wanna create a, a balanced range of hands that I can continue with on a flop like this. Uh, clearly, we're going to continue with our very strong value hands. Uh, big pocket pairs, ace queen, king queen, queen jack suited, um, ace x suited spades. We're also going to have sets of eights, sets of threes, um, sets of queens. Also, would be calling at least one bet with a pair such as jacks or tens, and would also probably be calling one street with a hand like ten jack suited. We can comfortably fold a hand like nines, sevens, sixes, fours, twos. Ace-king and ace-jack though are two hands where I wanna fold some of them, but I probably don't wanna fold all of them. For our ace-jack combos, obviously we're gonna continue with ace-jack of spades. And I would like to include one more combo of ace-jack, and I believe that ace-jack of hearts fits this criteria. It gives us a backdoor, not flush draw. We are, of course, drawing to an over pair if we hit an ace. And uh, we could get a good card on the turn that would bring us either a, a gut shot. A 10 on the turn would give us a double gutter. So I think that this is a hand that we want to call this bet with. So we go ahead and make the call for 75. The turn is a pretty good card. It's a king of hearts. I like this card for multiple reasons. Uh, clearly, because it brings in the nut flush draw for us. 
It also brings in a one card straight draw. And it's possible that this person could have connected with the queen with a hand like ace queen or queen jack. And now they are going to be more susceptible to being pushed off their hand if it comes down to that. But the small blind shows no signs of letting up. He bets $250. This is a fairly large bet. It's a pot sized bet. For this opponent in particular, I think this bet gives me some information. It tells me that he has a strong hand and he's potentially afraid of being drawn out on, which makes sense because the board has two flush draws on it and there could possibly be some straight draws as well. I don't think that the king scared him too much. Um, so we could be looking at a hand like king queen or pocket queens or possibly a lower set, eights or threes. He could be semi bluffing with a hand like 10 jack, but we block some combos of 10 jack. Um, 10 jack of spades is obviously still alive, so that could be something that he would play this way. We're not getting the direct odds to call here. Um, the pot's laying us two to one and we need three to one to make our call profitable. We could raise and hope to pick up some folds, but the way this hand played out, I think it's very unlikely that he's got a hand that he'd be willing to fold here. The hands that I think he would be bluffing with, I could see him still making the call, and I also think that a lot of times he's just got a speed already. So I have to consider whether or not I have implied odds if we make our hand on the river. My gut tells me that we do. I think that a heart is not super scary for him if it comes since it is a back door flush that comes in and not the front door flush which would be spades. So we make the call and we hope that if we hit our hand we can get paid off. River comes a nine of hearts. We make our nut flush draw. This is one of my favorite moments in poker. It's that moment when you know you have the absolute best hand possible and all that's left is to figure out how to extract max value from your opponent. Small blind checks. So now it's on us to decide what should we bet here to ensure that we get called by the largest chunk of our opponent's range at this point. We want to make sure that we bet a size that will get called by two pairs, sets, and also some top pair hands, although I don't think he's going to have a lot of top pair hands here in this spot. He could have a hand like Ace King, maybe, but I find it to be one of his less likely holdings. I think the hand that I'm really looking to target here is Ace Queen as sort of like the bottom range of hands that I think he'll call with. So I'm trying to think, what can I bet here that will get Ace Queen to call? I also want to make sure I don't make the bet too small. So we're looking at a pot of about $750. I settle on a bet of 350. It's less than half pot. We could go a little bit smaller, but I feel like a lot of my opponent's range is going to be strong enough to call this bet. But unfortunately, that's not the case. He folds. So in hindsight, I'm not sure if our bet was too large. Maybe we should have sized down to about 250 or 300. Possibly that would have gotten a call, but it's hard to say. If our opponent was semi bluffing, he's not going to call anything. Our only way that we would attract any value on that river would be for him to lead out to continue his bluff. And then once again, he's going to fold if we raise. It's possible we might have got max value on that hand, but he could have. He might have got away from a hand like ace queen. I don't think he would fold a hand like king queen, and I definitely don't think he would fold a set. Real quick, I want to comment on the fact that all these hands are so far large hands that we've won, and it can kind of seem like 
that I'm skewing towards these hands. Um, but this particular session, we just ran really well. There's no other way to spin it. We didn't miss very often and we didn't lose hardly any showdowns and the ones that we did lose weren't that interesting. They were limped pots with hardly any action. With that being said, let's go into our final hand that we're going to discuss. We've got pocket kings in the hijack. Middle position leads out for 25. We three bet to 100, it folds back to middle position, and he makes a call. The flop is king, queen, jack with two spades. Obviously, we drill this flop with a set of kings, but there is a lot to be afraid of here. We've got spade draw, we've got three cards in a row, so there's plenty of flop straights out there. You could have a hand like ace-10, you could have a hand like 10-jack, so, I'm going to have to tread a little bit lightly in this hand. Middle position checks. We have a very strong hand here. And even though the board is super connected, super wet, we do need to protect our hand. If we give a lot of free cards here, there are a ton of bad cards that can come on the turn. And whether or not that puts our opponent ahead of us, it's going to put us in a precarious spot where we're going to have some difficulties trying to figure out if we are ahead or not. So we put on a half pot size bet of 100 and the middle position player calls. Turn is a seven of clubs, definitely not a scary card. Middle position checks and we bet 225. As before, I think that we still have a very strong hand and we don't really want to check back. So we put in about a half pot size bet. Middle position calls. And the river is a nine of hearts. Again, middle position checks. So I'm trying to think of hands that we beat and we'll call a river bet here. And I'm coming up with pocket jacks, pocket queens, queen jack, four combos of ace king, and a small amount of combos, I think six combos of king jack and king queen. The pot's about $850, and I decide that I want to put in a bet here. Um, I really believe in trying to get thin value. This is a hand I definitely feel like we could bet fold. Um, I don't want to bet too small because a lot of times that can induce some weird stuff from your opponent. Like if you, if you lead out with a, you know, quarter pot bed or you know, fifth pot bed or something like that. A lot of times you'll get players to bluff in that spot. We're gonna have a tough time bet folding if we bet small and get raised. So I settle on a bet of $300. It's a little more than third pot and I feel like we're only gonna get re-raised by hands that have us beat. There's one card straight on the board so a hand like pocket 10's got there, a hand like jack 10 got there, a hand like queen 10 got there, and of course, if he has ace 10, he had his beat from the start. All of these hands, I feel, would comfortably be able to re-raise us. So we go ahead and decide that we're gonna bet a little over one third pot, and if our opponent re-raises all in, we're going to have to seriously consider folding. But we don't have to, he just calls. So we table our hand and he says it's good and throws his hand into the muck. In these live games, thin value is where you get a ton of your profit. A lot of players would probably check in this spot and then you know, make a scared call if the opponent bets. We don't want to bet fold too often because obviously our opponents can abuse that. But the bet fold is definitely something that every uh, mid stakes live player needs to have in their arsenal. But luckily for us, there will be no bet folding decisions on this hand. So we ended up putting in about six hours. We were in for a thousand and we cashed out for a little bit under 3,000. So, great night. 
like I said, we ran really well. Uh, it was a pretty good game. There was a decent amount of rec players in it. There was some tougher players too, but we didn't get tangled up in too many hands with those players. So far, this month's been pretty good. We're definitely experiencing the positive side of variance, and we hope that that continues. I wanted to uh, let everyone know that I've started to post some things on Instagram and Twitter, and if you want to, uh, you know, see more poker stuff, more poker content from me, you can follow me on those. If you have any comments about the way I play these hands, I'd love to hear your feedback. I definitely don't claim to be the ultimate poker authority by any means, and so I always appreciate any input that you might have.